Okay, well, I've been teaching architecture and architecture related topics at SETU for about 15 years. I'd say that during that time, I think my approach kind of fits the profile of many other uh, people like myself around the country and maybe other parts of the world. And that when it comes to discussing issues to do with climate change, I think what I tend to do is I, 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 uh, I react to the latest headline. And in many regards, my reaction might be seen as kind of ad hoc. I deal with the issue of the day. And when I'm talking to my students or for engaging them in projects, my response tends to be uh, technical and that we end up talking about uh, um, reducing carbon emissions and carbon footprint and that kind of thing. So when the HC initiative came along, it gave me the opportunity, I think, to be able to focus on some ideas that have been floating around, uh, you know, on the wing there and that I'd felt a little bit guilty about not really addressing. And then it suddenly occurred to me that this was probably the time when I should start to address. So it strikes me, having thought about it a little bit through the HC initiative, that there are lots of ways of talking about environmentalism or the climate challenge that we face beyond the ways in which I tend to discuss them. And one way which I would find very interesting, I think, is to look at the history of environmentalism, which I certainly haven't covered enough. And the idea that there is more than one environmentalism that we can talk of at least two, that there's a perhaps transcendental movement and uh, an imminent movement. But I'm not going to talk about that. What I'm going to talk about is something that I find particularly interesting and I think quite compelling, which is that I think we should be looking at our system of environmental management. In other words, how we plan and the tone and the line I'm going to take is related to, I think there's a, a clue there in the slide, which is the cover of Gray and Harmon's book, Object Oriented Ontology, which I must say I find very interesting in lots of different ways. So if I start the story like this, if I'm an architect and I'm going out onto the site and I'm going to design something, I'll typically find that I'm, if I'm working in an urban area, that there are lots of decisions that have already been made about my design before I even get started. So in an urban environment, a notional site might well be uh, located in an existing urban fabric, which we might also call uh, an area of embodied ideology or in, an area of, uh, of embodied legislation. And this has typically resulted from one or maybe more than one post enlightenment intervention so that I could be working in, say, for example, George in Dublin, which is a, a very strong uh, embodied ideology or Houseman's Paris, or in this case, uh, uh, in Edinburgh, in Craig's Edinburgh, uh, which is also Georgian, or I could be indeed in New York in um, working in the post Randall 1811 map, which in some ways is kind of the thing that describes the entity which is New York, even though it comes so early. Now, of course, these Enlightenment plans have their roots in much earlier thinking. They go back as far at least to Plato and Hippodamus and his plan for Miletus and also to John Locke, at least John Locke's writing, if not his involvement in uh, the constitutions of South Carolina, which were to become quite infamous. But I'd go so far as to say that they're a little bit earlier than that. In fact, they've got a biblical source. And I'm just going to quickly refer to this very famous quote from the book of Genesis, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over every living thing that moves upon the earth. The beginnings, if you like, of anthropocentrism. Uh, sorry, I jumped ahead or did I jump forward? Um, so that I think it is fair to say that with this line of thinking, pretty much every urban form, every urban ideology relates in some way, or most at least, to a long established right of the individual, which is to say the European individual, and it's ent entirely anthropocentric. You might say it's ontologically hierarchical. Now, as an architect, I'm out on my site and I'm in this ideological uh, fabric and it comes time to make a decision about what it is I'm going to do. And again, my decisions are limited by maps. The future, future possibilities for development on these sites are typically very, very anthropocentric. They're defined by geometric and I would say therefore abstract lines which are marked on maps or plans which only really ever serve to either do one of two things. One is to confirm ownership and therefore rights of ownership or B to determine 
models of economic exploitation and this is from the zoning resolution in new york and anybody who's ever worked as an architect in new york knows that this is kind of the bible this decides what it is that you can do on your particular site again very anthropocentric and in this paradigm which i think describes many paradigms as they apply across the western or perhaps as we say today northern world the protection of the interests of the environment is, at best, something that we can only really describe as residual. Now, if I'm in Ireland, I think the situation is just a little bit more complicated by the fact that in Ireland, of course, we are a little bit more centrally planned than they might be in the United States or other parts of Europe. So that if I'm getting involved in a piece of uh, a building, which is a, a public development, like if I'm going to develop a creche, or a national school, which would be the equivalent of an American grade school, or if I'm involved in public housing, typically I'm going to be handed a brief. And this brief is going to be very standardized and not particularly flexible. And it's going to apply no matter what part of the country I'm working in. So a creche in the north of the country in County Donegal is going to be very similar to a creche in the south of the country in County Cork. And the 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 brief that I'm going to be handed is going to make a lot of it's going to make a lot of sense anthropocentric and all as it is because it's concerned with things to do with health and hygiene and safety and security and things which as a parent I might have a difficulty giving up on however as an architect when I go to the site uh, this notional site I've been talking about I immediately almost inevit inevitably in almost every single case begin to challenge the rationale of the brief because I'm thinking, well, I understand the brief, but I'm not sure it's the right brief for this site. So this leads me to think, uh, as many have before, I have to say, that maybe it is time for a paradigm shift in how we actually plan a move away from the anthropocentric model. So if we were to do that, where might it lead us? Well, I think one interesting area that we might look at is in the thinking of the triple O movement, which I was referring to earlier with Graham Harmon, and the concept that the environment, or perhaps maybe the site or the locale, um, might be in some way seen as um, an actant, if we're to use uh, Bruno Latour's term. And this term is taken up by Jane Bennett, and it's the cover of Jane's book that we're looking at here, uh, Vibrant Matter, to which I have to say I'm very heavily indebted in this presentation. Now, if we're to go down this route of considering the environment or the site or the locale as an actant, how can we discuss a kind of a, a spatial strategy that sees the environment as a participant in this game? You know, how is it to be advocated? Who takes the role of uh, arguing on behalf of the site? It's, 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 uh, it's quite tricky. It's an intriguing idea, I think. And it's not quite maybe as far out as it first appears because at some level, in order to be an architect, you have to be at some level, I think, uh, a disciple of the triple o, triple o movement already, because as architects, we build things that end up being in the world. They are, they have a thingness, if you like, as the new materialists might say. Now, it might not be possible to, uh, it might be way, way beyond us. I, I, I suspect perhaps it is, is to be able to think of a way that we can um, develop a, a planning system which which has the which has the environment as an equal player. But there are possibilities, I think, of looking at other ways of doing things. So we might start a discussion by looking at non-Eurocentric models for decision-making about spatial design. Perhaps, though, we may have to go back and begin ab initio. The point is, though, I think that, is that uh, this is just one area that I think is worth looking at. And I think it is one area that is very interesting because it gives us the possibility of throwing ourselves into something that's interesting and engaging and intellectually challenging and moves us away from seeing the climate problem as something which is always depicted as something negative, that the world is going to burn. And if we don't do something about it very quickly and demonstrate or, or throw soup, um, you know, nothing's going to happen. But if we think about it in these lines or in these terms, that even though we're looking at perhaps a bleak future, there is a possibility of doing something positive if we work together to develop it. This is just one line of inquiry, which I find very interesting. And it's something that I'm hoping that I, I still feel motivated enough after HCI is finished that I can develop maybe with colleagues in SETU into something more formal. So thank you. Thank you, Gary.
great stuff um, already. 